Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Philippe Guérin. It's a pleasure to give uh, this lecture for the World Malaria Day 2020. I'd like to thank Dr. Amit Sharma, the director of the National Institute of Malaria Research in India, for this kind invitation. This is clearly a very special Malaria Day 2020 uh, in the middle of the current COVID-19 pandemic, and we are all very much aware of, uh, of the situation. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's also an opportunity to remind us that uh, malaria remain a very important uh, disease that we need to control and to eliminate, uh, if not eradicate, at the later stage. And we'll be talking about how do we um, come to zero malaria and how does that start from all of us? And this is very much the message from Rollback Malaria uh, for this year. So first, a bit of a background on the origin and opportunities. Um, the project that I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to use a lot of data from this project, is called WARN for Worldwide Antimalarial Resistance Network. And it's part now of a larger umbrella called IDDO for Infectious Disease Data Observatory. IDO was born of WARN, uh, which collates global malaria data to generate evidence and methods that accelerate elimination. The success of WARN triggered a request from over research community to apply the same approach to boost research and development for overall disease. And uh, this project um, started, the one project started more than 10 years ago uh, in 2009, and since then has evolved into IDO. And I'm going to run a short video explaining what IDO is about. Each year, more than a billion people around the world require treatment for a neglected tropical disease. Add to this the relentless risk of a range of vector-borne infections, and you have a group of diseases that affect over half of the world's population. What's more, global trade and travel make even more people vulnerable. Here at the Infectious Diseases Data Observatory, IDDO, we are helping to reduce this number by assembling information to improve treatment and control on a collaborative data platform for use by the health, research and humanitarian communities. We want to ensure safe and effective treatment for all patients affected by neglected and emerging infections. IZDO aims to generate reliable evidence and innovative resources that enable a research-driven response to the major challenges of infectious diseases, especially in low- and middle-income countries. We collate and standardise clinical, laboratory and epidemiological data within a framework that ensures equitable sharing of data and fair recognition for data contributors. Our unique data sharing processes enable the combination of different types of data from different locations and studies. Data are harmonised to allow rigorous interdisciplinary investigation of key scientific questions. Analyzing globally aggregated data provides unparalleled statistical power to answer critical public health questions that cannot be addressed by individual studies, such as the effects of specific treatments on very young children or pregnant women. We also ensure the security and accessibility of data so it can be productively used by the health and research communities in the long term. By sharing your data through IDDO, you will be helping to develop accepted data standards and improve data collection practice. Facilitate data aggregation to improve the power of research results. Identify knowledge gaps that will inform future research priorities. And ensure that the results of research and innovation reach the communities and countries affected. You will also be able to expand your network, meet the requirements of journals and funders, and increase the visibility of your research. Infectious diseases cannot be tackled in isolation. It's only by working together and sharing data on a global scale that we can reduce the devastating impact of neglected diseases and emerging infections. So, make a start today. To find out more, visit iddo.org.
So a word on the World World Antimalarial Resistance Network one. Um, as mentioned earlier, it started in 2009, and we have now a network of over 280 partners around the world in 17 countries. We have engaged investigators, we have shared data, uh, and we have now pulled over 180,000 antibiotic patient label data from more than 600 clinical trial molecular data studies or pharmacokinetic uh, studies internationally. This represents altogether two thirds of the total of the patients who have been enrolled in ACT efficacy trial in uh, published literature. So that's a substantial achievement. And with all these data, we are generating information that not a single uh, study can do in isolation. So how does it work? When investigators do share information uh, or from a study, they share the individual patient data. These data move into a secure environment where the data are curated, clean, standardized, and integrated into a repository. From that point on, with the permission of the investigator, then pool data can be uh, merged together and analyzed together. And then this piece of work generate research outcome, uh, outcome that can be used by policymakers or by regulator, and then uh, the product is published, uh, used for treatment guideline, and eventually change policy. The story of WARN in India is a long one, uh, and it has been summarized in a paper published last year um, in the occasion of the launch of uh, the Malaya Elimination Research Alliance India Initiative, Mera India. And uh, we mentioned that uh, since the beginning, uh, Professor Ganguly, who was the director of the Indian Council of Medical Research, was part of the board of WARN, uh, followed uh, by Dr. Nina Balecha, who was the director of the National Institute of Malaria Research, who was part of our scientific advisory committee for two terms. And now Dr. Anup Anbika is uh, part of uh, the data access committee of WARN. And we have uh, indeed a very close relationship also with the National Institute of Malaria Research today, uh, working very closely with them. On a regional initiative, we are very closely connected with the APMEN initiative, which is more specifically looking at the elimination of malaria and specifically of PIVAX, and this is a key partner in the region. So a brief outline of what we will be discussing today. We'll be talking about the epidemiology of malaria, the current challenges, and talking about artemisinin and partner drug resistance, HRP2 and 3 deletions, the unmet needs for vulnerable population, including malnourished children, patients with comorbidities like HIV, TB, diabetes, and pregnant women. We will also discuss about the collateral risk associated with the current COVID-19 pandemic looking at excess mortality, looking at the use of hydroxychloroquine and the role of the Indian pharmaceutical industry in the response of this current pandemic. A word on the epidemiology of malaria globally. Looking at the World Malaria Report 2019, which tells us more about the cases in 2018, 93% of the cases are still reported in the African region, where 3.4% are coming from the Southeast Asia region, which includes India, and the rest being distributed in other regions, uh, which are malaria endemic. 18 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and India carry 85% of the global malaria burden. Let's have a look at the trends from 2011 to 2018. Estimated for 2018, 228 million have been reported and 405,000 deaths are estimated on this particular year. On the graph, we can see that the number of cases which were decreasing from 2011 to 2013 then plateau and increase since then to reach now a level which is higher than the last record in 2011. The number of uh, deaths seems to plateau, if not decline a little bit, but we are obviously in a situation where we are not 
gaining that much on malaria control and we are losing some ground. So let's look at uh, what are the challenges for control and elimination of malaria. Starting first, and that's really data that we have been accumulating from world on anti-malarial resistance. Let's have a look at historical data of chloroquine and SPE resistance around the world. In blue, you will see the spread of a chloroquine resistance and in purple, the spread of SP resistance. In blue, very rapidly from the emergence in Southeast Asia, there were a second foci of resistance happening in Latin America. Resistance starting spreading westward from Southeast Asia in turn to Asia, India and then into Africa. And the same events about 20 years later happened for SP leading to a situation where chloroquine and SP has been reported across the world, starting from Southeast Asia or emerging from Southeast Asia, then spreading, spreading westward through India and entering the African continent. Let's have a look at the research and development done around artemisinin in combination therapy in the 90s. The artemisinin derivative, which were initially coming from a Chinese plant, where isolated in the 70s, it had a very rapid action, a broad stage of specificity, was safe, gametocidal, and reduced the chance of resistance by being partner with another drug with a longer half-life. This combination were then recommended by WHO in the early 2000s and has been since widely, widely recommended around the world. Unfortunately, in 2007, the first report of artemisinin resistance came from Southeast Asia, again from the same place in the, on the Cambodia and Thai border. When looking specifically at the historical evolution of anti malarial resistance from the Mekong region, we can see that chloroquine dropped very early its efficacy from 80s to 80, 85, followed by SP, followed by quinine, while mefloquine was introduced at a dose in monotherapy of 50 mg per kilo, it became also very rapidly resistant. An higher dose was tested, but again, the same event happened. Then in the mid 90s, ACT was introduced, and we had about 10 years where the combination of artesunate plus mefloquine with a Swede regimen retained a very high efficacy. Unfortunately, as mentioned earlier, with the emergence of artemisinin resistance, this efficacy started dropping in the, in the late 2000s. And we have observed the same trend with Dihydro artemisinin piperaquine, and over ICT more recently introduced. So we are in a situation where we've got now artemisinin combination therapy in Southeast Asia being fully resistant or close to. What is the situation in 2020? The last 10 years, we have seen artemisinin resistance spreading from Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, South China, and Myanmar. As part of the one project, we have put in place a surveillance of molecular markers associated with resistance from published and unpublished uh, sources. So let's have a look more specifically at our artemisinin molecular surveyor which has been assembling data from 69 countries as of today. As you can see on this map, which is reporting all the data which are currently published or unpublished, there is clearly a foci of resistance of artemisinin in Southeast Asia to date. Now focusing more specifically around India, there were relatively recently a few reports of artemisinin resistance nearby the region of Calcutta. Now, it seems that this resistance level of, of artemisinin has not been yet reported in other study than the one um, which were published in late 2018. This might be due to the fact that this was an epiphenomenon which has disappeared. Nonetheless, it tells us that there is probably a potential of artemisinin resistance emerging from that region, and we need to remain extremely vigilant. So what next? Well, there's probably in different places in the world an epidemiological context whereby artemisinin resistance can emerge. 
And the question is probably not if it will emerge, but how quickly it can emerge or how quickly can it spread around the world. There is to date a few sites around the world in Rwanda, Comoros, Guyana in Latin America, and in India, the first report of artemisinin resistance. Those needs to be confirmed, but the risk is there and we need to be prepared to face this particular issue. And moving on to the ACT partner drugs, which are used in combination to the artemisinin derivative. So we've got the same system of surveillance of the published and unpublished literature, looking at specifically at um, markers which are associated and validated for the resistance of lumefantrine, amodiaquine, chloroquine, and mefloquine. Again, a huge amount of information collected on this map, which is giving us some indication of where resistance is. The last tool I would like to mention is the surveillance of a sulfadoxin pyrimetanine markers associated with resistance. In this interactive map, we can see that there is clearly a foci of resistance in Southeast Asia and in the eastern part of Africa, as well as Latin America. If we focus on the Indian subcontinent and we select DHPS 540, which is a mutation which is usually observed where there is a quintuple mutation for sulfadoxin and pyrimetamine, we can see that there are quite a lot of reports of resistance above a certain threshold, which is quite worrying for India. Yet those data are not really recent and the coverage of that is not totally adequate. So on the level of resistance of XP in India, there are some signals which indicate that resistance is there and has been there for quite a while, but data are sparse. What else can we look at? In a few weeks, we will be publishing a live open access database of treatment efficacy, which has been done around the world illustrating the trends and evolution of number of clinical trials which has been conducted for pivalciparm or pivivax in all anemic regions. In this report, we can see that India ever came third as the number of clinical trials which has been conducted in a particular uh, country for pivalciparm and second for pivivax. So quite a lot of information generated from India. Yet again, back to the issue of accuracy and timely information, the data are quite numerous, but not necessarily up to date, leading to a situation where we still have issues in accessing uh, information to guide policies. Ultimately, what we would like to see is maintaining the efficacy of the current ACT because we don't have an alternative to the ACT to date, and this will take probably another 10 years before we get this kind of alternative from a different family of drugs. So we need to have up-to-date surveillance data of resistance. Molecular markers can be a reasonable proxy of clinical efficacy, but we need to have a proper geographical coverage it needs to be timely and updated regularly to be informative. They were the first signal of artemisinin resistance in India. This might be an epiphenomena, yet it tells us that we need to be and remain vigilant. On the point of the concept of combination therapy, both the artemisinin derivative and the partner drugs should remain very highly efficacious, both of them. In the context of the, art, the combination artesunate and SP, this might be challenged by the fact that there are, to date, reported level of resistance of SP, which may actually lead to the fact that the artemisinin derivative associated with it, artesunate, is left alone and is used in monotherapy. This does not translate in a drop in vivo of the efficacy at the very beginning, but this is leaving the artemisinin unprotected by the partner drug, which may result in further emergence of artemisinin resistance, and this needs to be considered for the future. Moving to the surveillance of uh, Vivax and, and resistance to Vivax, 
The drug of choice for buybacks remains chloroquine today. Yet again, on this tool, which is accumulating information of reported of resistance to chloroquine from around the world, focusing in the Southeast Asia region and South Asia region, we can see that there are already reported cases of chloroquine resistance in India. This is worrisome and should be further investigated to see if chloroquine remains a drug of choice or if other alternatives like ACT should be considered for PVIVAX. Specifically focusing on PVIVAX infections, uh, we conducted an individual patient data meta-analysis looking at two aspects of the treatment. One, how can we prevent recurrence and what are the factors which are affecting the recurrence? So we assembled 37 clinical trials, which were altogether almost 3,000 patients treated with chloroquine alone and about 1,790 of patients treated with chloroquine plus primaquine. What we observed was that in children under five years old, increasing the dose by five milligrams per, per kilo would prevent 41% of the recurrence. Now, looking more specifically at the impact of adding primaquine as a radical, radical cure of Vivax, the addition of primaquine reduced recurrence by 90%, not only in early recrudescence, but also in late relapse. Yet we know that the treatment of primaquine in radical cure, cure, which is currently 14 days of treatment, is challenged by the adherence to the treatment. More research is needed specifically in India to look at if higher dose and reduced regimen could be adequate and observing the same impact than the current uh, regimen of 14 days. Another challenge that I would like to mention is the emergence and spread of pifalciparum, HRP2, and HRP3 deletion in anemic country. So the ECD-enriched protein 2 is specific to pifalciparum. It is the target of the majority of the rapid diagnostic tools which are currently on the market. HRP2 RDTs have a higher sensitivity and thermal stability compared to PLDH RDTs and have been a preferred choice. Unfortunately, in 2010, the first report of HRP2 and 3 deletion happened to be notified from the Amazon region. High prevalence soon after was reported from Eritrea and they are now reported in several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia. Let's have a look at a recent review published by colleagues in Trends in Parasitology in December 2019. In this map, we can see that the prevalence of HRP2 and 3 deletion is fairly high in the western part of Latin America, but it's starting also to be reported at relatively high level in some part of Africa, in the, core, in the whole of Africa, as well as in South Asia. There are still massive gap of information in India and more information should be collected to know what is the level of deletion which is impacting the performance of a RDT in that region. A recent protocol has been made available by WHO in February 2020 and should be looked as the recommended rec uh, methodology to measure the level of deletion in the region. Last challenge that I would like to mention is the optimal dosing for, of all the ACT for all the population. Along these 10 years where we have pulled a lot of data, we have identified factors associated with poor treatment of efficacy. Often they rely on various similar factors. Pregnant women and small kids do not respond like population that has been usually studied in clinical trials. Patients with comorbidities like malnutrition, obesity, or HIV do have also a lower efficacy and a lower response to the treatment. The same happens with patients receiving a treatment with anti-tuberculosis antibiotics, or if they receive a poor quality treatment, or if we observe a particular regional diversity. All these factors are actually the underlying roots of drug resistance and must be understood very well. When looking at population at increased risk of suboptimal dosing of ACT, and specifically looking at the population of Africa, and this is an unpublished work, we identify that over 25% of 
of the population receive an anti-malarial are most probably sub-optimally dosed. Now, putting that in perspective of, cer of certain countries like Niger or Mali, which has a relatively high level, high level of malnutrition, in a population like Nigeria, which is very large, we've got a fair amount of the population who are pregnant, and finally in Mozambique, a fair amount of the population who have also a comorbidity of HIV. So all these population put together are not actually a marginal population and should be looked more specifically. When focusing on our attention on malaria and malnutrition, we did a systematic review screening almost 3,000 articles and identifying 33 articles looking specifically at the association between malnutrition and risk of malaria or the impact of malnutrition in anti-malarial treatment efficacy. Unfortunately, from the literature, the evidence of the effect of malnutrition on malaria risk remains inconclusive. What does that tell us? Looking simply at the literature doesn't allow us to look at the clear correlation which is complex between malaria and malnutrition. Looking specifically at artemeter lumefantrine dose in malnourished children, we did an individual patient meta-analysis accumulating 2,800 kids, some who were malnourished, over who were non-malnourished. What we found that was that kids under three years old, about a quarter of them at lower concentration of lumefantrine than adequately nourished kids and 53% lower concentration than adults. What does that tell us is that there is a correlation between the absorption of treatment and being malnourished, leading more specifically to a lower efficacy of the treatment. We are currently conducting an IPD meta-analysis and preliminary results tell us that the more a child is malnourished, the more the chance is to fail treatment. And this is particularly a concern in countries like India, which has a fairly high prevalence of malnutrition in the kids' population. Over comorbidities are also a concern, but there is to date limited answer. Patients with HIV, co-infection, tuberculosis, elmantiasis, or even COVID-19, we don't quite have a clear understanding on, on how both comorbidities do impact the efficacy of treatment. There are also preliminary data indicating that non-communicable diseases like diabetes, like obesity, like hypertension are also associated with lower efficacy of the treatment. So all of that needs to be further studied. And it's particularly a concern in India where a lot of these diseases are operatively high prevalence. Finally, I'd like to talk about the collateral risk of COVID-19 in the context of malaria control. Looking first at the situation of the very large outbreak of Ebola in West Africa in 2014 and 15. As Ebola was spreading, the healthcare system became very rapidly overwhelmed. Insufficient resource for malaria control in this region led to increased mortality and morbidity, decreased number of reported cases and deaths compared to previous year, which was probably associated to the fact that the surveillance system was unable to capture this information. And it was estimated that more than 7,000 additional malaria-associated deaths among children under five were reported in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. That was the situation for the Ebola outbreak. In the concern of COVID-19, there are fear that the health system will be as well overwhelmed and access to malaria treatment might be limited. And this is something to look at very carefully. So what can we do? There must be a focus and a lot of attention to prevent malaria death. Early symptoms of COVID-19 include fever, fatigue, and myalgia. It can be confusing with malaria and led to challenges in early clin clinical diagnosis. Fear of being diagnosed with COVID-19 or stigmatization may prevent patients to come to the healthcare clinic. Access to healthcare should be preserved. Malaria diagnostic and treatment should remain a priority to avoid an excess mortality associated with malaria. And this is a concern that you might have, and effort should be made 
to ensure the connection with the community, clear communication to avoid that excess mortality. Finally, a word on chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine for the treatment or prophylaxis of COVID-19. Both drugs are for aminoquinolines and have been used in millions and millions of uh, patients for the treatment of malaria. Four aminoquinolines are active in vitro against a range of uh, viruses, and this is the reason why it has been proposed for the treatment of COVID-19. To date, there is open non-randomized hydroxychloroquine study with limited evidence available. There are more than 80 clinical trials testing chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, sometimes in combination with other drugs, which are not yet, not yet published. One study very recently last week using high-dose chloroquine plus azithromycin in Brazil was, was stopped uh, prematurely after the report of 11 deaths in the cohort of 81 patients, and it was believed that the deaths were associated with cardiotoxicity with this uh, drug. So this is a concern. Overdose of, uh, of these particular drugs will cause potentially fatal outcome, and they should be used very carefully. We still don't know what is the right dose to be, to be used, which is still don't know what is the impact of these drugs. Is it better to use it in treatment or in prophylaxis? And there is probably an urgent need to look at the, at the result of the trial that will come very soon. Finally, a word on the consequence of COVID-19 on the global supply of medical products, and that's a, an article that we have just published. Sub-Saharan Africa imports over 70% of its pharmaceutical needs. India alone is the largest supplier of medicine to Africa in 2018, reported to be up to one-fifth of its pharmaceutical import. Indian manufacturer represents 77% of the 563 WHO pre-qualified product globally. Preventing a significant disruption of the Indian pharmaceutical generic industry is critical, not only to answer to the needs of India, but to answer to the production of drugs or vaccine that will be extremely important when they will be identified and would have to be scaled up in terms of production for India and for the world. This is an opportunity for the Indian manufacturer to show their capacity and their resilience to manufacture high quality product, not only for the national market, but also for the rest of the world in this fight against COVID-19. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. I do hope that Zero Malaria starts with you, me, and all of us, and with a common effort, we will succeed. And I wish you all the best in these difficult circumstances. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you have any questions, do contact us at info at Goodbye.